Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alan. Uh, most of you uh, presumably know me. Um, and I, I ran across uh, a little while ago an interesting topic um, called automatic differentiation or autodiff. Um, and it's it's probably about the coolest thing, at least that I can remember, uh, that I've run into that also made me say, after learning how it works, oh, well, duh. So uh, hopefully you all find it interesting and understandable. Uh, let's look at what the shape of the actual talk is going to be. Uh, first step, uh, we're going to remind ourselves a little bit about uh, what derivatives are. Uh, I expect that it's been, for some of us, decades since our last calculus class um, and nearly as long since we actually used calculus. So even though this is pretty simple math, uh, it'll behoove us to remind ourselves of how it works. Uh, then we'll move on into how autodiff works. Uh, first, really quickly, the key insight with a lot of hand waving and then a more explicit explanation of how uh, the forward and backward mode algorithms actually work. And then we'll, we'll really quick uh, run into one particular application, which I think will be very interesting for folks at Google uh, for why we would care about this. All right, uh, so let's get through the math uh, here. Uh, first thing we need to remember are univariate derivatives uh, and our geometric intuition for this is if we have a function f, the derivative of f, f prime is going to be how sensitive f is uh, to response, how sensitive f is to small changes in x, infinitely small changes in fact, um, or alternately, we can look at it as the slope of the tangent line through the point x comma f of x. And uh, of course, we can put that into a more formal definition for those of us that are, are mathematically inclined and throw together a limit here, which is just saying, okay, take a tangent line um, through f, through the graph of f rather, um, at a point x and a point very close to x and take the limit as that point very close to x gets closer and closer and closer. Uh, and eventually uh, the distance between them goes to zero. And if that limit exists, that's your derivative, at least in a single variable. Uh, and as we all will recall from our high school or, or potentially early undergraduate calculus classes, uh, there are a lot of very convenient features uh, of derivatives. If I have uh, two functions that I already know how to differentiate and I take a linear combination of those, then the result is a linear combination of their derivatives. Uh, the product rule tells us that if I take the product of f and g, um, and then I take the derivative of that, then the um, that's going to be f prime g plus f g prime. Quotient rule, uh, similarly calculatable, slightly more uh, convoluted um, and a little bit more of a nuisance if you're doing things by hand, but not so bad that it's going to be a problem if we try to code it up. And then of course, our, our old friend, the chain rule, uh, f of g prime is g prime times f prime of g. All right, uh, so univariate derivatives, I'm gonna pause here real quick. I don't expect any questions, but one, two, three, grand. Uh, all right, so not every function that we deal with is going to operate on a single input. Uh, this really shouldn't surprise those of us with a computer science background. It's almost impossible to find a function in production code that only takes a single input. Uh, so we're going to want to extend the idea of a, uh, of a univariate derivative into derivatives uh, in multiple variables. And the idea is very simple. We're just going to pretend uh, that there's only one input and that all of the other ones are constant. And then we'll do that for each of our different inputs and collate it all into a vector, which we will call the gradient vector. Uh, once again, we can formally define this in limits. Uh, differences between this and our original definition. Uh, we've moved now from R to Rn, and we've introduced this ith unit vector, uh, ith Cartesian unit vector, uh, which is being multiplied into our step size h. Uh, that is um, restricting us to moving in one of the cardinal directions when we take the derivative. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with uh, the ith Cartesian unit vector, in three dimensions, uh, the first Cartesian unit vector is 1, 0, 0, the second is 0, 1, 0, and the third is 0, 0, 1. Uh, so uh, if you've taken a physics class recently, that's the i vector, the j vector, the k vector. And then we throw in some additional notations so that we can remember what these things are, uh, partial f, partial x. Uh, hopefully we all remember that uh, variant on Leibniz notation. And then nabla f is the gradient, uh, which is vector valued, of course. Similarly, uh, sometimes we spit out more than one output uh, from a single function, and we're going to play the same game. Uh, we're just going to look at each thing individually and glue it all together at the end. And in case any uh, English majors are walking by that we want to scare or impress, we're going to give it a fancy name and we're going to call it a Jacobian. Don't even need any, don't even need any new limits here. Uh, we just go ahead and say, okay, it's the vec it is the matrix of all of these partial derivatives. 
And that is going to conclude our calculus uh, reminders. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Then we're going to move into the computer science part of the talk. Uh, and the first thing that we're going to note uh, is that calculus is hard, OK? But really, only one half of calculus, uh, specifically the integration half. I would invite all of you to please take a moment to navigate over to that XKCD. And if you're wondering why I have the link there instead of including it directly in the slide, uh, it's because lawyers scare me. Uh, but uh, right, differentiation is easy. It's a very straightforward flow chart. We have you know five operations, all of them with well-defined uh, edges in that flow chart. Uh, we don't have to worry about teaching machines to burn evidence uh, and the ethical conundrum that comes there. And we don't have to solve natural language uh, processing in order to call mathematicians if we get stuck along the way. And as we all know, if you can put it into a flow chart, you can put it into a program. So differentiation is imminently programmable. Uh, we just need to sort of do some groundwork. Uh, there is one other hiccup we're going to run into, though, which is that if we're trying to differentiate an arbitrary computer program, it's not necessarily going to have a convenient closed form. Uh, we're going to be playing a lot with the toy example of x squared y plus 2y. I could, in fact, uh, you know, teach a computer to take x squared y 2y and spit out symbolically the gradient for that function. And if anybody uh, has ever stopped by Wolfram Alpha, they'll do that for you uh, for any function you ask. Uh, but if you have an arbitrary computer program, it might include loops, it might include branches, there can be recursions. If you're doing a fixed point iteration, it gets very, very difficult to impossible to actually get that into a closed form that you can hand over to a symbolic differentiator. But uh, when we actually execute that program, uh, eventually, assuming it terminates, it has to boil down to some finite composition of things that can run on your CPU and specifically your, your arithmetic logic unit on your CPU. And we know how to differentiate sums. We know how to differentiate products, differences, all of those things. Um, and we know how to differentiate transformations on those, uh, as we discussed in the refresher section. So uh, our eureka moment here is that we just take this differentiation flowchart and we uh, apply it to the function defined by the execution of a numerical program, which allows us to compute the Jacobian of a function at a point at the same time that we compute uh, the function f at that point. Any questions about the very, very hand wavy approach that we've got thus far? All right. I'm hoping that means that I'm clear and not terribly, terribly confusing beyond anybody's capacity to ask questions. So uh, that was that was hand wavy. Uh, if we want to actually teach a computer to do it, we need to get a little bit more concrete. Uh, so we're going to do that with the forward mode. And the core abstraction here is the idea of a dependent variable. So if we're actually taking a derivative, uh, we're going to have in the middle a lot of intermediate calculations um, that we perform. And normally, we're going to leave them anonymous, right? If I have x squared y plus 2y, I'm not going to give a name to x squared and to x squared y and to 2y. I'm just going to work it through. Um, but there are still dependent variables uh, that they correspond to. And we can take derivatives with respect. Uh, we can take the derivatives of those with respect to our inputs all the same. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to keep track of uh, every dependent variable, uh, including these anonymous intermediate ones. Um, and we're going to track their gradients with respect to our initial inputs. Uh, and because we know about the product rule, the quotient rule, the linearity of um, uh, derivatives, et cetera, uh, we can propagate these forward uh, without any real difficulty. And the only problem we have left is to figure out what are our initial um, gradients uh, to populate uh, our function with. And for that, it's very easy, uh, because um, for two independent variables, x and y, uh, dx dx is 1, dy dy is also 1, but dx dy is 0 and dy dx is 0. So all I have to do is create this indicator uh, to use this indicator function to create my, my gradients such that my first argument, uh, its gradient is going to be 1 followed by zeros. My second one is 0, 1 followed by zeros, so on and so forth. So let's, let's look at what that means uh, concretely. Um, usually a little bit easier to see these things uh, with an example. So we're going to look, again, our function, our toy function is going to be x squared y plus 2y. And we're going to imagine that this was written, say, in Python as x times x times y plus 2 times y. And uh, the order, of course, that that would execute in is the order that we're going to follow our uh, 
calculation in. So x times x, we're going to call g1. Uh, and that's going to give me nabla of g1 is going to be x times this vector plus one uh, plus this vector times x, which this is exactly the product rule, right? Um, f g prime, f prime g. Uh, and note, okay, f and g are both x in this case. So that's why we've got x's there. And we already discussed that our bootstrap uh, vector was going to be this one zero or for y it'll be zero one. Okay, then uh, our next thing is we're going to multiply x times x times y. So that's g1 gets multiplied into y. And we can once again do the product rule. Uh, only now uh, we're gonna have this nabla g1 here because we're using g1 instead of x there. G3, we do a similar thing. We're multiplying by a constant. G4 uh, is in fact going to be f, is going to be the sum of G2 and G3. And I will leave it as an exercise to the reader. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do it now, uh, but if we plug and chug uh, from top to bottom and actually resolve delta G2, sorry, not delta, nabla G2 and nabla G3, uh, we should eventually get out 2xy and x squared plus two, which if we take this by hand is exactly what the gradient should be. Any questions? That sounds good. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for speaking. I was beginning to worry that I had lost connection. At the speed of the presentation, uh, we're going to need the slides after the fact to follow up. <laughs> You'll have them. Don't worry about it. Um, in fact, they're, they're uh, publicly available on GitHub. Okay, uh, so let's see what that would look like uh, in Python. Uh, this is a toy implementation. Please don't use this in prod. Um, but it, it should be enough for us to get the concept. Uh, we have here uh, a f depth var object, uh, which stands for forward dependent variable. Uh, and we've got an underscore in front because this is not something that should be viewed outside of the auto diff package. And all it's going to do is it's going to create a new numerical data type, uh, which knows, okay, the value and it knows the gradient like we were using on the last slide. And then we're going to define rules uh, for creating new f depth vars uh, that uh, correspond to our linearity, product, quotient rules, et cetera. So let's look specifically at um, mole. Mole is slightly more interesting uh, than add. And okay, two things to note here. First, we always return an fdep var. Uh, that way it's contagious if I multiply a constant into my gradient aware um, calculation, I still get a gradient aware calculation flowing forward. So that's, that's the first thing we note. The second thing we note is that we do check if we get an f depth var um, being multiplied into ourself or if we get um, just some other object. If it's some other object, we're assuming here that it's a constant, that gives us a slightly different rule um, for our gradient, um, right? If you have x times some constant, the derivative is, is um, just uh, going to be the constant rather than going all the way into the uh, product rule. So we have slightly different rules for calculating our gradient there. We always multiply by G, uh, regardless of whether we're in this constant multiply case or if we're in the more general, okay, we have two dependent variables being multiplied together. So the value is, is pretty naturally propagated through. And then if we are uh, multiplying two dependent variables, this is exactly the product rule, right? That should be pretty easy to see, F prime G, F G prime. And then, uh, in order to make this work, uh, we can define a forward function uh, that we can use to annotate other functions, uh, which will take a function f and it will replace it with a function fj, uh, where f returned some uh, numerical output. Uh, fj is going to return that numerical output and then also the Jacobian at that point. And all we're doing is we're taking all of our different args uh, via var args and we're going to wrap them in fdep var objects using, okay. The initial value that makes sense that's going to be the same and as we discussed we're going to bootstrap with this vector of zeros and a single one at a particular point uh, so that's going to be our initial gradient and then we just call the function um, with these wrapped variables and then we do a little bit of work down here to repack it into a reasonable shape uh, if we just turn back a bunch of private data types that's going to be very awkward so we go through and we grab okay give me all the values and give me all the gradients package them together into something that looks like a vector and a matrix. And then, okay, maybe you actually weren't uh, a vector valued function to start with, in which case we'll preserve uh, the output shape a little bit better. Any questions about this? 
Anybody willing to say they understand what I just said? Yep. Okay, we got one of you. Um, I will take that as uh, permission to continue moving forward. All right, uh, and that is that is uh, the entirety of of the auto diff forward mode algorithm. Uh, it has a couple of caveats uh, worth noting. First, every scalar operation in our program has now become a vector operation, uh, at least as implemented here. There are other ways that don't use vector ops, but that still have this same sort of uh, n times uh, calculation expense. Um, but now it's more expensive, right? If I have three inputs, who cares? Um, if I'm doing f of x, y, z, or f of x, y, doesn't matter. Two times fast is still fast. There are functions uh, which will have thousands of parameters. Uh, those thousands of parameters almost certainly not implemented by having a function with thousands of formal parameters, but with uh, you know a vector valued input with thousands of dimensions. Um, and those those are going to get really slow if we try to solve uh, for their diff for their derivatives in this fashion. So we're going to want another approach for that, which is where backward mode is going to come in. And the, the key idea with backward mode is that we don't have to take derivatives only with respect to an input variable. Uh, if I have functions f, g, and h, and an, independent, and an independent variable x, uh, then I can take df dx, I can take dg dx, and I can take dh dx. But I can also do you know, things like df dg and df dh. So I'm not constrained only to having dx in the denominator, which is what forward mode does, right? We have various intermediate functions, all differentiated with respect to x, and then we build them forward to finally get to the function we care about uh, differentiated with respect to x. Backward mode is going to take it, unsurprisingly, in the other direction. Uh, we're going to find the derivative of our final interesting function with respect to each of the different dependent variables that we calculated along the way, and then eventually we'll get all the way back down to uh, df dx. And we're going to find uh, that the multivariate chain rule is very, very, very useful for us here. Uh, so we restate it briefly. Um, if I have a function f, uh, which takes in multiple parameters and we're differentiating with respect to x, and x has sort of snuck into f via both of those parameters, uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take my partial in both parameters and then multiply in my total derivative of x in both of those parameters. Uh, and as always with Leibniz notation, it's easiest just to make sure that, okay, df, dx, my g's cancel out, we're good. All right, so I'm not sure how I'm gonna do this. Uh, so as always, uh, if we can't solve it in computer science with a graph, we probably can't solve it. So let's start by building a graph. And we'll note that my calculations naturally form a DAG as they feed in from into one another. So x squared y plus two y, our initial inputs are going to be x and y, and then, okay, there's a constant two over here that we're not going to care too much about. And, okay, x times x, that's going to feed into x squared on both edges. Uh, we're going to keep track of uh, every edge that gets... Um, we're going to keep track of every operand going in, even if it comes into the same node uh, twice. All right, x squared y, product of x squared and y, 2y, you get the idea. And now we have this nice little uh, directed acyclic graph describing our computation. Okay, that's something. Uh, what, what more information do we have available while we're building out the graph? Well, I can always take the derivative of x squared with respect to x while I build it out. And I can do the same thing. I can take the derivative of x squared y with respect to x squared. So I can get sort of local partial derivatives as I go along. And that's, that's our next step here. Uh, so first up, uh, and this is probably the most confusing part. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time here x squared derivative with respect to x is 2x. So you might be looking at this and saying, okay, why, why is that x? Um, does anyone want to be brave and uh, chance a guess as to why x is the, um, the value that we're putting on this edge here and not 2x? That's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, just go ahead and give an answer then. Uh, so x squared here is x times x. And if I take uh, the partial derivative of um, function f of a and b is a times b, can somebody tell me what the partial derivative of f with respect to its first parameter is? I was just going to say this would have been a lot less confusing if you'd done the x times y case first and then come back and done x, x times x. 
let's do that. <laughs> if if that's uh, we have somebody who's who's moving forward in the story and thinks it will be more clear, so let's do it that way. Uh, so let's let's look at x squared and then uh, x squared y and then x squared. So the partial derivative of x squared y uh, in its first parameter uh, is going to be y. So we have a times b. Uh, partial derivative with respect to a is b. Partial derivative with respect to b is a. So when we take these partial derivatives, we are just going to swap uh, the inputs. Uh, so y came in here, it goes out there. x squared came in here, it goes out there. We have a similar thing with x uh, squared going on here. So x comes in both sides, so x goes back out both sides. And the thing I was really hoping that somebody would notice, uh, and kudos if you didn't just were too shy to, to speak up, is that uh, x uh, squared with respect to x is 2x. Um, and notably, if I just add up along all of my edges, that's what we're going to get. Um, so, so keep that in the back of your head. We'll get to that real soon. Uh, similar rules here for, for the rest of the graph. 2y, the 2 is going to move over to the other edge. And with the sum, uh, the partial derivative of x plus y with respect to x is 1. Partial derivative of x plus y with respect to y is also 1. And uh, as we will have uh, sort of, as what we'll have, this is sort of suggested by our x squared uh, case. Uh, but if we actually look at the, the multivariate chain rule carefully, we'll notice that if we know dfd parent for all of our parents, uh, then we can calculate dfd self uh, by taking a weighted sum of dfd parent weighted into all of our various edges. And we also always know the derivative uh, of the root node, dfdf is always one. So if we can just do a DAG order traversal uh, doing these weighted sums, then we have in fact solved our uh, differentiation problem. And I wanna be clear here, this is a DAG order traversal, not a depth first search. Uh, my first instinct whenever I see a graph is just to DFS it, that's not gonna work well here. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, all of our parents are done before we start trying to use DFD parent. Uh, hopefully that's obvious. And then also because we're doing a weighted sum along all of our edges, we need to make sure that we're traversing every edge, not visiting every node, which is sort of the, the more standard uh, graph traversal shape. All right, so what does that look like in practice? Uh, we've got our old graph here. We have replaced sort of these symbolic notions with our initial DFDF is one and everybody else is currently at zero. And we're going to yank uh, using Khan's algorithm, the root node, and propagate and then repeatedly do that until we get to the bottom. So one times one is one, one times one is one, add those into zero, you get ones, great. Uh, next up, uh, one times two is two, add that into zero, you still get two. This was a constant here, so I don't really care what's going on with its derivative, we're never gonna look at it. One times x squared, well, that's gonna give me x squared times two, one times y, that's gonna give me y. And then y times x, y times x, two xy, ta-da. Uh, we have uh, completed a backward mode traversal of uh, the graph. Any questions? Anybody just wanted me to go through it a second time? Sure, yeah, please. Okay, so remember the core idea here is that each of these nodes is going to have inside of it uh, the derivative of f with respect to the intermediate dependent variable that it represents. So this one represents f in its total. This is the entire x squared y plus 2y calculation. Its derivative with respect to itself is 1. So uh, then I'm going to implement the chain rule uh, to learn the total derivatives of f with respect to uh, this one here was x squared y, and this one here was 2y. Uh, and that's going to be 1 in both cases, uh, because again, we're multiplying dfdf by this partial derivative here and this partial derivative here. So now uh, I have this intermediate function, let's call it um, g1, and that's going to feed down to these next two, sorry, this is the one that goes next. Uh, I have this intermediate function here, uh, which was uh, 2y, and the derivative of 2y with respect to y is two, so that's gonna get pushed through uh, and multiplied in, and we're gonna have a two there, two times one is two, plus zero is still two. And now we go up to this next one uh, in our dagger order traversal, one times x squared, x squared plus two, one times y, y, y times x, y times x, add those together, two xy, add zero to it, still two xy. 
All right, uh, so I'm not gonna give you the code on slides here because it gets a little bit hairier um, and it's, it's not quite so simple that I can just slap it up uh, and it's gonna fit in 10 lines. Uh, there's a Git repo, uh, which I will uh, provide a link to at the end, which contains all of the code referenced in this deck. Uh, it's crude, it's ugly. Please, 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 please never use it in production. There are a bunch of other much, much more mature, much more efficient uh, libraries available to you if you ever find yourself needing this. All right, uh, so caveats here for backward mode. Uh, we've solved the dual problem and there are always trade-offs uh, between primal and duals. Uh, in this case, uh, we are going to find that we are going to scale in terms of compute cost in the number of outputs that we have rather than the number of inputs. Uh, because what we've noticed here, right, is that we do this full propagation and that tells us our derivative exactly for f. But if I've got an f here, or if I've got an f1 here and an f2 here, right, I'm gonna have to push both of those through separately. Uh, the second thing is that we have had to keep in memory the entire calculation graph. Question on what you just did. Yes. Um, what, won't those two graphs um, share things which your computer shared? And you look like you were uh, incrementally propagating. So it looks like um, if they have shared intermediate results, then you still are getting the same saving as if you'd gone forward. What am I missing? Uh, so the, the thing here is that uh, each of these intermediate nodes so these, constructing the graph is gonna be shared, right? These partial derivatives are the same regardless of, of what function I'm propagating backward. These intermediate results that we're calculating are, let's say we have F1 and F2. Uh, this is going to have DF1 DX, uh, or sorry, DF1 DX squared is what this node would be. Oh, you've polluted it with the root information, haven't you? That's yes, exactly. Right, so yes, you can, now you have to attach a vector at each node according to all the, all the uh, all the different routes you're propagating. Sorry, carry on. No, very good question. Uh, please don't apologize for asking questions. Um, so we, we now have to remember the entire graph. Uh, so in addition to having this input output uh, compute cost trade-off, there's also a space trade-off. Uh, and again, if you have a short calculation like our toy one here, the amount of space is going to be measured in tens of bytes. If you're doing millions of flops, this can start to create memory pressure and uh, become relevant. All right, uh, so why do we care? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to make some very, very aggressive simplifications here. So warning, warning, warning. Uh, if, if you find a more in-depth resource which disagrees with something I'm going to say in the next three slides, uh, trust that resource, don't trust me. Uh, also, uh, if you understand uh, the climax uh, that we're building to, which I'll give you in just a second, feel free to go ahead and, and skip over to uh, meme gen or, or uh, email or what have you, uh, nothing I say is going to enlighten you and it might offend you with the liberties I take. Uh, the, the climax is backprop is exactly reverse mode automatic differentiation as applied to a neural network. So if that made sense to you, go ahead, check out um, and then check back in in a couple minutes. For everybody else, uh, crash course on machine learning. Uh, machine learning is basically optimization uh, and it is going to boil down in most cases to one of two problems. It's either classification or regression. For classification problems, I've got uh, some set of positively marked data and some set of negatively marked data, and I'm asking you, please find me the best decision boundary, uh, such that all of the positively marked stuff is on the left-hand side and all the negatively marked stuff is on the right-hand side, or at least you know, as much of the positively marked stuff is on the left and as much of the negatively marked stuff is on the right. Uh, regression, uh, I'm going to say, okay, I've got these points. They've maybe been corrupted by noise, but I think it's a line. Uh, find me the line which best fits that. Uh, and that's that's really all that ML is. And the way that we usually deal with that is that uh, we move from this vague notion of best uh, into a formal loss function, uh, which is going to tell me how good any particular model that I build. Uh, that model is going to be tuned um, by parameters. Uh, this is conventionally denoted theta. It is almost always vector valued. Um, and if we also have training data X and Y, uh, we formulate the overall problem as find me the best, that's what an argmin is, um, argmin theta, find me the best theta for this loss function on this training data that I've got. And if that's a little bit too abstract for us, we can consider the case of a linear regression uh, where we say, okay, we've got, we know it's a line. We, we know that we have uh, n different input uh, scalars, and we know that the final output is some linear combination of those. So I just want to find 
the value theta, which if I take uh, the inner product of theta into point x will give me the right point y. Uh, and if we assume that it is corrupted with white Gaussian noise, then in fact, the optimal way to do that is to formulate your loss function as an L2 norm on the distance between your training data uh, inner producted with uh, theta and differenced with all of your um, training outputs. Uh, any questions there? Anybody want to know what an L2 norm is? OK, we apparently have a much, much deeper uh, ML uh, expertise in SRE than I realized. But if no one's going to ask, I'm going to keep moving. I don't know if you saw the hands raised. I cannot see anybody's faces. Uh, yeah. I, I need people to talk. Yeah, I, I, uh, I will take it. I, I, I believe about half the hands went up, asked. but uh, um, I wasn't counting. Uh, so L2 norm. Uh, distance functions uh, is, is really where we need to start there. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to measure distance between two points. Uh, trivially, uh, we can move between units. Uh, if we're considering the distance between Los Angeles and Houston, I can measure it in meters, I can measure it in centimeters, uh, but I can also do more interesting uh, things like measure it in flight time uh, or measure it in the number of degrees uh, shifted um, longitudinally and latitudinally uh, between those two cities. And uh, because there's sort of that very general aspect of, well, I can measure distance in many ways, mathematicians want to have just the core nugget of, okay, what's in a distance function? And the formal definition requires three things. Uh, first, uh, you have to have uh, the distance between X and Y. Um, if I go directly to X, sorry, if I go directly from X to Y, that's always going to be at least as short as going X to Z to Y. So that's the so-called triangle inequality. Uh, the distance between x and y has to be the same as the distance between y and x, so there's a symmetry requirement. And last of all, the distance between x and itself has to be zero. Uh, the L2 norm uh, is uh, the distance function, really the, the norm corresponding to the distance function uh, in normal Euclidean space. So this is your standard, uh, the distance between two vectors x and y is the square root of their inner product. Uh, there are other norms uh, which turn out to be interesting in certain cases. Uh, the L1 norm, uh, or so-called Manhattan norm, uh, will look at the absolute difference um, pairwise uh, between two vectors. And that corresponds to distance in a place like Manhattan, where you can move up and you can move right and left and down, but you can't move diagonally. Uh, so uh, there are, in fact, uh, a countably infinite number of these so-called P norms. The, the two really fun ones are L2 and L1. Uh, L0 is interesting, but not practically useful most of the time. And similarly for L infinity. Uh, the TLDR here is when somebody says L2 norm, they mean Euclidean distance, and it happens to be optimal in the event that you are looking at data which is corrupted with Gaussian noise. Uh, Gaussian noise, of course, uh, noise which obeys a bell curve. All right, so I have my optimization problem. Great. Uh, how do I solve it? Uh, nine times out of 10, uh, you're going to solve it with something called gradient descent, which is impossibly simple in concept. The idea is if you are on a hill and you want to get to the bottom, you're going to walk downhill. So if we imagine that we have a loss function uh, as our z-coordinate and our inputs as our x and y-coordinates, then of course we get the graph of that is going to be a topographical map. Uh, and the best place, the lowest loss function is going to be whatever the lowest point on that topographical map is. It, of course, works in higher dimensions, but it doesn't visualize as well. And it turns out that uh, the gradient on our loss function tells us which way is downhill and specifically which way is steepest downhill. So I can create just this fixed point iteration here, which says, OK, start by grabbing a random set of parameters, figure out what my gradient on my loss function is, step in the opposite of that direction, um, and then do it all again and again and again. And eventually, uh, assuming you have some, some fairly moderate uh, assumptions on the shape of your loss function, and you do some reasonably intelligent things about your step size so that it gets smaller as time goes on, you're guaranteed to get to the bottom of a valley in your loss function. If you have multiple values, uh, multiple valleys, uh, you might find yourself at a local minimum, but uh, oh well, uh, at least you found a local minimum. And uh, that is very frequently uh, how things are trained, uh, how neural networks specifically are trained, uh, is with some variant of gradient descent. 
Uh, trouble is that formulating our gradient for our, neuro, for our neural network is kind of a pain. Uh, so it would sure be nice if we could efficiently generate it at a point programmatically and efficiently, uh, even if we've got, say, a recurrent network uh, where one layer is feeding back into a previous layer and therefore we've got looping and we can't even, even if we wanted to, get a closed form out of it. And uh, if we've been paying any attention at all, we will recognize that that's what Autodiff is. Uh, and a couple of small points here. Um, neural networks have lots and lots of parameters. Uh, you'll have one for every axon in the network. Uh, so you are going to want backward mode because lots of parameters, but one loss function. So M is way, way smaller than N. Uh, and this is frequently called backpropagation or backprop uh, for historical reasons that I don't actually know. Okay, so if you tuned out because you already know about backprop and neural nets, feel free to tune back in. Uh, if you want to look at the source of this, it's up on GitHub, um, on my personal GitHub at autodiff-edu. Uh, that includes the lecture, it includes the code uh, that was used for the lecture. It's got all of it. And with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. You seem to have basically implied that I should um, use run my neural network in both directions continuously because the backprop uh, gradient model is a neural network running in the other direction in terms of how it runs. Um, I haven't actually considered that. Uh, generally, you don't ever run an, a neural network backward ex except while you're training it. But I'm, that's an interesting view on it, uh, is, is viewing this, this backward propagation through the, this graph that we've created as another neural net. Um, I'm not sure it buys us anything, but it, it certainly is interesting. No, I was thinking more from the point of view of the when you're building your structure, um, you, you've got one graph which you're already using forward. It's the same graph going backward. Yes, um, absolutely. And it, therefore, the, the node which you consider the neuron should be considered a neuron which has the feature you're talking about built in, at which point you're not go, you don't have a separate phase. You're just running continuously. Um, yes, uh, basically. Uh, so. There are a, a couple of, of minor hiccups there, but uh, if you look at something like TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, they have built-in backward gradient, and it's it's in fact formulated as an aspect of a tensor. Uh, so what you do is you you push the tensor forward through the network, uh, and then you don't always actually need the backward, uh, right? If you're at test time, the backward prop isn't necessary. Uh, so you don't always compute it, and it does always have a cost um, in memory. Uh, to actually keep track of the calculation as it occurred. Um, so you won't, won't necessarily always run backward mode. But yeah, it's run it forward. Uh, tensor objects are gradient aware, so then run it backward. Um, yeah. Uh, I've used um, Python libraries that do the forward mode before. It's really handy. Um, back when I was actually doing statistical analysis stuff uh, in a previous job, um, I used to routinely do that as the way of, because I was far too lazy to do differentiation by hand. Um, and you could get it for free with a library. Uh, I haven't come across a library which has backward mode. Um, in the past, haven't come across a library which has a backward mode just available for free, basically, the way the forward modes were. So this looks really nice. Um, so yeah, uh, I, um, I'm going to have to go off and play with the code and find out all the ways in which it doesn't work. Oh, I'm, there are going to be a lot. This is you know university undergraduate school project grade co uh, code, not production. I can't say that enough. Uh, if you want to look at something uh, and try to break something interesting, um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, AD, JAX, um, just within Python, all do various forms of um, automatic differentiation. Uh, please try to break them. You'll have much too easy a time uh, with this Git repo. There will be no challenge. Um, I, so um, I've got to let somebody else ask a question, but I've got another one for you. Which, but uh, let's let's have a, somebody else first. Sounds good. So I have a question. Uh, for for example, the the, the gradient descent uh, example you gave. Uh, what's the advantage of automatic differentiation over something like numeric differentiation, with just a small step size? Um, automatic differentiation is exact uh, to machine to machine precision. Uh, numerical differentiation, uh, right? If you're if you're doing sort of like a moral equivalent to a Newton's method or a um, RK four integration. Right, you, you always have to specify some amount of uh, numerical um, tolerance, right? RELTALs and, and ATALs. And 
this will give you the exact answer, except for, okay, floating point arithmetic is never exact. But aside from that, this is mathematically exactly what your derivative is. So if you are using um, rats, uh, rational number data types instead of floats, uh, you can in fact get the exact derivative for your arbitrary uh, function rather than having to deal with, okay, I am correct up to one e minus six or one e minus nine or whatever. When I've used these tricks, to answer that question slightly differently, when I've used these tricks in the past, um, the uh, if you take the code which is computing those derivative bits that go in the nodes and explain to it how um, the enabler operator operates on other data types, uh, then you can, in one pass through the graph, compute arbitrarily complicated derivatives rather than doing them one at a time, where with numeric, you basically have to do a numeric differentiation for each point you want. But if I want to have the derivative on a grid, um, I, I can literally take the value of x and um, say the value of x takes all of these values and just compute all the derivatives in parallel in one pass. Because the the it, the 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 power of actually understanding what Nabla does means that uh, you're you're not being numeric. Right, but there there was uh, the assumption that we weren't doing branches. Uh, I mean, if if we we're, we're, we computed at a, a point, uh, right? Um, and if you had a branch uh, in your code, that would require computing this symbolically for both cases well, of for, branch or something. Um, like. Alan can correct me, but my suspicion is the backward mode doesn't like branches. Um, the forward mode is completely fine with branches. So branches are technically okay in either case. You do get th there are some sharp edges, which I've, I've glossed over here, if you do have branches in your code, um, right, abs, uh, absolute value is, is a very simple example. Uh, it is differentiable everywhere except at zero. Uh, so if I have, you know, an absolute value function inside uh, my arbitrary um, numerical thing, I will get correct answers everywhere except at zero. Um, and uh, if I have sort of a very, very intelligently implemented auditive package, it might recognize that you attempted to take an absolute value at zero and throw up its hands and say, no, this is not differentiable. Um, this crude example that I've given uh, would, well, actually it doesn't implement less than. So this one can't do any sort of comparison, but uh, you, you could also wind up uh, very easily with an example which just uh, says, oh, well, you're going to get sort of a left or a right derivative um, on accident and not realize that you've, you've taken a subgradient where you meant to be taking a gradient. Right. Uh, but you know, if you're working on sort of like an arbitrary numerical calculation and you have, um, you know, a finite countable number of discontinuities in the function that you're you're computing, the likelihood that you've actually by chance landed on one of those discontinuities um, or non-differentiabilities is almost certainly zero. Uh, so, to some extent, you can say, ah, eh, whatever, I don't care. For those that, that are not familiar with uh, probability theory lingo, almost certainly means it can technically happen. There are events in the space, but there are so few of them uh, that uh, the the probability as you account for the much larger space actually does go exactly to zero. And this is the sort of thing where you have to start talking about countable and uncountable infinities. And I will lose all of you uh, in, in the, the next 10 minutes. If I try to cover all of that, I'll also lose myself. So uh, no judgment on you all. Um, I actually, I have a small thing since we've got 10 minutes. I'm going to interrupt the questions, uh, give you all a moment to think of new ones. Uh, to if I can't find this graph. So here we've actually kept um, the graph of the calculations as a graph, uh, and we're you know propagating through in DAG order by following Khan's algorithm and actually yanking the node and mutating the graph each time. Uh, You'll note uh, if you're if you're very perceptive that this node right here uh, was added in last, and we yank it first. Then this node was was added in, and we yank it next. And then this node was added in, we yank it next. The order we're removing nodes uh, in our DAG order um, traversal is the same order that we added them in, uh, and that's perhaps not surprising because the way that this is constructed, you can get more parents as time goes on, but you can't ever get more children. So we can do um, a little bit of an optimization here uh, called a Wengert list, I believe, 
uh, where instead of actually storing this sort of as a normal graph, uh, we can just keep track of the order in which we add the nodes, and that'll take care of the, the DAG ordering. We still need the edges so that we can do the weighting uh, and the, the accumulation, but we can just you know append a list, append a list, append a list, and then walk it backwards, and uh, that'll spare us any sort of complicated graph traversal stuff. All right, and I'm going to slide back into questions now. Um, now that you all have had 30 seconds to either become more confused or to come up with more, more topics to discuss. All right, well, if, if, we're, uh, if we're out of questions, okay. I guess we, we in, stop. In, in that case, I'm going to ask you to explain how second derivatives work. Oh, um, conceptually, uh, it's, it's similar. In practice, the code that I've written will not do, do um, second derivatives. Uh, because it, it has assumptions about the only thing that will ever use an fdep var is my auto diff function. And if you wrap the auto diff function with the auto diff function, uh, now we have problems. Uh, so this implementation can't handle it. It's the same uh, concept, right? F prime prime is the derivative of F prime. Uh, so you, you can do much the same concept. I'm told in practice uh, that uh, people actually, there are optimizations that can be made uh, rather than just nesting it. Uh, when you calculate f prime prime by doing something special. I don't know what those something specials are. Uh, I saw this. I thought it was cool. I learned about it. Um, I'm unfortunately not familiar enough with that to speak too intelligently about it. It's a very good question, though. I just uh, can't answer it.